Thank you, Chairman Lewis and the rest of the board. We really appreciate um, the chance to give an update to the board. Uh, we've submitted a written update um, in March or so uh, as part of the communication to HUD that the agency's made, but there's a great chance for us to go through and give an update um, of all our research. Um, just to introduce our team, we've added uh, Judy Yu Ying Jing um, to our team this past year, but I continue to lead it working with Kathy, um, Kathy Strick, who's got a social work background, and also Dr. Lee, who's an uh, expert on program evaluation. He's an economist um, like me. So this is our study team. And uh, just a quick overview, we've been working with the Housing Authority of Champaign County since 2011, as, and we were included in the application to HUD in their MTW application as an outside evaluator. And our evaluation, as stated in the application, focuses on the second main goal of the MTW program here around family self-sufficiency. So the big question we're asking is how is the MTW program implementation here um, affecting family self-sufficiency? What are we learning? And um, so we're gonna describe um, the impacts we're seeing, and also we're gonna make some comments about how we think the MTW program has changed HACC over these past um, years that MTW has been being implemented. Um, HACC is a really important part of the national level moving to work initiative. Um, it was brought in with several other agencies in 2010 and, and in that time period. Um, and evaluation was an important part of those agencies that joined at that time because HUD didn't know that much about how the program was working. Um, and so the results from Champaign County have been reported out nationally and HUD policy staff are uh, watching what's happening here in Champaign County. And um, our evaluation in terms of the analytic approach is unique because we do qualitative interviews key informant interviews with individuals participating in the program, and we're also doing um, statistical analysis with 5058 administrative data. We have access um, to treatment plan data, and also we do a social survey. So some of our key findings, especially over this past year, uh, we continue doing the qualitative work. Um, the themes that we're seeing is uh, when we, when we inter analyze the interviews, we're looking for themes around respondents' reports about housing, housing quality, employment, um, employment barriers, employment successes, education, education gains, um, health issues um, that come up, financial situations and goals, and comparing them um, between the HACC people we study and the people we study from a non-MTW agency. Um, overall, we're seeing that HACC participants um, are reporting more stable housing and better housing condition, conditions than the comparison agency. And uh, here we're seeing marked increases um, and people are reporting them in their interviews of um, increases in employment, income, and education gains. Um, and then this past year, we've been analyzing the case notes um, from the local self-sufficiency program. And we looked at them from the period 2012 to 2016. We're seeing that 30% um, of the um, MTW eligible people are now um, accessing LSS case management services over that time period. And that's a, a significant increase from before MTW or from um, before 2012. And then on the quantitative side, um, a big thing is we're seeing a statistically significant increase in annual earnings, um, a statistically significant increase in the probability of a person having a employment and um, having more jobs nearby and better access to public transportation is directly related to people doing better in the program. Um, but we also see some people, those caring for disabled children, 
folks that have uh, especially a felony background on their record um, struggling and having uh, that's having a negative impact on their ability to succeed in, in the workforce. Our overview of what we're doing, we have um, four main thrusts of the analysis. We have a quantitative social survey that we've been implementing over time. And we have qualitative key informant interviews that we do with about 20 some um, HACC participants and then also people from the comparison agency. And we get the case notes from HACC's LSS program and we have access to the um, administrative 505 data from HACC and then we have data from um, HUD as a data release that we have data from um, six other agencies that we can do comparisons with. And so just on the social survey, um, we've been following people over time. Um, we're happy to report that in 2016 and 2017, the response rate, um, working with the agency to improve that part of the study, the response rate um, for HACC has gone up. So we're having more complete data about the program participants. All this data is completely confidential. There's no um, reporting of any individual level identifying information in our papers and in reports, uh, but we're really happy to see the increase there. Um, we're doing a bit better with the non-MTW agency, and that continues um, to be a challenge to make sure that we get good response because we need to sort of prove a result, we need to have a comparison. And, and so that's why that's so important. Um, one of the challenges that we've had, though, from the project-based voucher units at Oakwood Terrace, Oakwood Trace, Sycamore, and Thornberry, the response rate is um, really low. And that's been a challenge. Um, and we need to work on that. It affects the quality of the data. Um, because that's now a significant number of program participants um, in those units. And, um, and so uh, we're having a 7% response rate there. If you look at the rest of the program participants, the response rate's much higher. And so um, we're going to need to work with the HACC management to see a, a way to improve that and work with the management of those um, units. On the key informant interviews, we're letting people tell from their perspective um, their own situation with regards to self-sufficiency, anything else they want to talk about, and especially about housing. And so far, we've conducted 105 interviews, 45 with HACC participants, 41 non-MTW, and 19 wait lists. Three of those folks have transitioned into current participants. And we follow them over time. Every couple of years, we do a key informant interview. And, and here's some of the comparisons we're seeing from people's um, own reports, looking at the non-MTW agency and the MTW agency. Overall, a theme is that the housing situation for the MTW folks has been uh, more stable over time, whereas the non-MTW um, less stable. Um, the issue about work requirements and term limits comes up for the MTW um, people, and it's not an, uh, an issue for the uh, non-MTW. In terms of housing conditions, MTW respondents have talked about um, responsive landlords, um, pest control, and major maintenance, but still talk about rowdy buildings. Um, but we haven't heard about substandard living conditions. However, in the comparison agency, we talk, this isn't a survey of everybody. It's a survey of key informants. We randomly identified them, but um, it's, it's a small number. As I mentioned, it's 20, and people have to bring it up. Um, and, and we do have a social survey that covers many of these things, too. Um, but this is the results from our qualitative work. We're hearing more problems um, from the non-MTW agency. In terms of employment, for the ones we've been able to analyze, we have uh, people talking about 
work histories with increased employment hours and increased income. Still plenty of challenges, though uh, many of the people are working low-wage jobs. Um, there are some success stories we've seen, but um, others, people in um, close to minimum wage or minimum wage jobs. Um, similarly, in the other agency, um, in the ones we've analyzed, we have the mixed employment outcomes and also um, barriers around criminal background. Um, one of the cases we've analyzed, the health conditions was a serious barrier. Um, education, some of the MTW folks are um, increasing their education and uh, that's compared to the comparison agency um, where we see some but a little less there. On physical health, um, in both agencies people are talking about chronic and acute health conditions. Um, and, and for the ones we've been able to analyze for MTW, um, we're not seeing health affecting their employment. Um, for the ones we've analyzed in the non-MTW, um, that's more of an issue. And then similarly on mental health, um, reporting of a mix of mental health outcomes, stress, anxiety, people talking about um, discrimination in the job market or in other places. Um, one MTW participant um, depressed and suicidal. If we come across a person um, that talks about that, then by our IRB refer, we have to um, try to refer them to resources. Um, if, if somebody talks about something like that in, a, in an interview setting. Um, overall, people in MTW, um, in part because of things like the LSS, are able to articulate goals, are tracking progress towards goals. Um, some of the people in the comparison agency are doing the same. Um, we're seeing a bit of a difference between the two agencies. And then um, in terms of this local self-sufficiency program, um, just as a reminder, there's a work requirement in this program for able-bodied 18 to 54 year olds. It's been phased in the first research. They develop a, a self-sufficiency plan. The second, one adult member must be employed 20 hours a week or enrolled in education or training. By the fourth, one adult member must be employed 20 hours a week and all other adult members must be employed 20 hours a week or enrolled in education. And by the sixth, all adult members must be employed 20 hours a week. This was implemented in 2013 and modified in 2016 to 25 hours weekly. So the work requirement went up in 2016 and also an eight-year term limit was introduced in January 2016 and eliminating these phases. And so we've been looking at the self-sufficiency program. Um, we're getting electronic case notes from the case management system of the social workers. And what we have to do is come out with a way to analyze this unstructured data. We have 2,100 or so case notes for 532 head of household participants and their dependents and adult household members. So we worked on a coding system, extracting variables from those case notes around um, a name, employment status, education status, health, mental health situation, whether they had a 90-day letter or a termination. So one of the key things in the national debate is, is there a differential around termination for MTW agencies? And um, so we're trying to dig in here and understand uh, this process in some depth. We also are using the 50058 data and case notes from 2012 to 2016 to determine who accessed the LSS program, the case management services, how many times, and what were the reasons behind them. And here's some of the things we're seeing. So the, um, the blue line is all the MTW eligible 
over time starting in 2012 going through 2016. The red line is the, the number of people in, um, in the case managed in the treatment plan and it's grown from about 2% of the blue line in 2012 to about um, 30% in um, 2016. So a significant increase in people who are um, in that program and getting those services um, over time. We analyzed how many years the people who accessed the LSS case management from 2012 to 2016, how many years they were in involved in the LSS case management. Um, about 29%. Can you tell us what LSS means? It's the local self-sufficiency program. Um, and, um, and so in the first year, 29% uh, used it one year out of the five years. 31% used it two years. Um, 26, three years, 13%. Uh, four years, and a small 1%, but just a few used it um, each year over that time period. So that gives you an idea of how much interaction um, people are having in the program. And then this is, uh, we wanted to understand uh, what's the pathway of people who are um, in that program, how many um, get employment, how many get an exemption or a waiver because of a health condition, um, how many age out, become 55 and older, um, and here's what we're seeing. Of the 532 in the LSS program um, in that time period, um, 418 continued to access the LSS in 2016. 114 no longer access LSS in 2016, and 65% um, were employed out of that 114 and and so on. The ones that we especially want to watch are um, end of programs and 90-day uh, termination uh, letters and termination notices. And so it's and in this group of people it's just a small number um, but we'll be watching that over time and also um, looking at people who are terminated who are not in the LSS program. Um, so t turning to, to a more quantitative <coughs> data about the um, impact of the program on employment and incomes, um, we wrote a paper this past year in a municipal policy journal here, and here are two um, charts from that paper. And the basic story is the HACC is this line here. And you can see from 2011 to 2016 that the annual household income increased um, significantly and at a much higher rate than similar sized agencies, Illinois housing agencies and uh, agencies, public housing agencies on average nationally. And, um, and then when you look at household earnings, because income can include sources of income beyond um, employment, but when you look specifically at earnings and break it down by um, participants that are in the LSS program, participants, um, all the HACC participants, the comparison agency that we look at, and then also um, the comparison agency looking at their LSS participants and all their participants, you can see HACC has um, moved up significantly over time in percentage terms. And this graph gives it in, in money terms easily. Um, that annual household earnings from 2011 to 2014 um, for HACC jumped up from 2012 to 2014. And, um, and one more tab, please, thank you. Um, and then when you look at the probability of holding a job um, for HACC um, LSS program eligible households, that increased um, over that same time period also. And some of the things that um, yeah, explain um, the 
and are correlated with people that are working 25 hours or more weekly um, at the community level, having more jobs nearby their homes, having better access to public transport, having a higher median household income is uh, negatively related with it, but the other two are positively related. And then having a disabled child is negatively related to working more, so um, those people are having a much harder time. And then um, in terms of increased um, likelihood of working 25 hours or more, being female, African American, less criminal history, less, and if people don't have a high school diploma or GED, less, or if they've received mental health services. And um, as some people may recall, this was a concern all the way along in MTW about what about people that face any barriers or challenges? How does that fit in their ability to adhere to program requirements? And, and that's why we're looking at, at these things. Um, and then um, in terms of education, some of the people have been successful in, in um, finishing degrees or working on education goals. Um, people with higher household incomes are less likely to enroll, uh, young, uh, older people are less likely, and people with less than a high school diploma or GED are less likely. We looked at employment and job satisfaction um, and compared it with people who are working 35 or more hours and who are in the program, or 25 to 34, or less than 25, and as you might expect, um, people who are working less are more dissatisfied with their employment situation compared to the people who are working um, more. And then um, we've been tracking and um, concerned about the interrelationship between mental health, anxiety, and stress um, and adhering with program requirements for people. Of, most of the participants are single mothers, um, many of them with children. And so we're tracking depression and anxiety um, using two uh, depression scale and an anxiety scale. Um, and that's correlated with work also. Um, people who are working more um, are, are um, less likely to um, report depression or anxiety compared to people who are unemployed. Uh, uh, Kathy, if you can go back. Just one point, um, still significant fractions of the population are, are scoring on these questions um, as depressed or um, anxious according to commonly used public health mental health screens. So what have we been doing to report out? Um, in October, we sent 2,000 newsletters, um, both to HACC and also the non-MTW Comparison Housing Authority um, uh, age range participants. In December, we published an article um, that's available nationally. In January, uh, we provided the interim executive director with information about the survey to include in the newsletter. In February, we submitted our annual report um, to the agency for their inclusion in their report to HUD. Uh, we have this presentation. We'll also present in Washington um, at, a, at the MTW conference next week. And um, I'm sure, again, there will be staff from both sides of um, the aisle from Congress and also HUD staff and uh, GAO staff and other agency staff that are tracking um, these programs nationally. And then uh, later in May, we'll make a visit to the non-MTW comparison agency um, and provide an update. And we um, value the relationship and the support of their ED and the staff um, for allowing us to work with them, um, even though they're not an MTW agency. So to wrap up, um, this program is evolving. I would say when you look at the participants now, they're different than the participants, say, in 2008. That, uh, because of 
um, when m m people are coming into the program, there's an expectation that people have a stronger work history. And also the work requirement is moving that uh, work up. And, and so um, the agency's changing a bit. Um, the profile of participants is different now than it was before, um, especially regarding the work history. Um, the more people are utilizing LSS case management, there may be a need to look at that aspect of the program and um, just see how it's functioning and, and whether the people that have more barriers to work are able to, over time, um, o overcome those barriers and get the supports they need and uh, whether there's, there's enough there. And then um, the LSS household employment outcomes continue to increase, especially around the area of education and skills. Um, however, people with a disabled child, we're seeing that, that they're having a difficult time um, meeting their um, program goals, and, and um, we have to track that. Um, the key informant interviews show progress with education, employment, social networks. Still, um, many participants have a really difficult path the labor market's not easy for them. Um, many of them are balancing significant child care responsibilities and other responsibilities. Um, and, and so that they're reporting that, and it's in our reports. We need you to hear it. Um, and HUD needs to hear it. And uh, the HACC nationally is a significant MTW demonstration. And um, some of the unique things here are the way the work requirements are being implemented and also the time limits. So thank you.